Okay, just <coughs> as a means of introduction. So what, what uh, happens when we um, when we look around? Uh, there are lots of things we want to know about, and um, the challenge is to uh, come up with uh, a what and a where uh, set of uh, answers. And the reason we want to do that is that eventually we'll act and move ourselves around and do something. And so hopefully uh, the, the visual, vision process is uh, useful uh, for something. Uh, and so the big question we've been working on is what is there in the big box? And um, uh, unfortunately, but in fact fortunately for us, it's a complicated question. It's very interesting and there is no way to, um, to define uh, in the abstract what uh, you need to do and then uh, use uh, some engineering principles or some mathematics to derive what architecture is here. And so we have been messing about with what should be inside. And <coughs> so this is a slide I show in class when I introduce vision. Um, uh, the, the way we think of it as engineers, and so I will, I will try to tell you about two approaches that people have <coughs> in thinking about this architecture. And so as engineers, uh, this would be an updated version of what uh, David Mare, I suppose, would have said, is there are uh, stages, and we have to recognize the fact that there is an early uh, visual system that, that um, extracts features from images, and hopefully those features are more informative than just pixel values. But if you try to do too much and do recognition off the bat, you may not be uh, so successful. So you, you extract some intermediate or early representations, and then through grouping, and perceptual organization, you figure out what goes with what, and at that point you can um, extract shape uh, and uh, distances and trajectories, and you can recognize objects and surface properties and materials, etc., in entire scenes. And so this is the engineering point of view. And so um, it's you know it's slowly morphing in the sense that uh, now we don't feel that necessarily recognition has to wait for grouping to happen. Sometimes grouping happens after recognition. And so we, we put double-headed arrows to hedge our bets when we draw these uh, diagrams. So more or less, this is what uh, engineers think about. And, um, and so today, I'll focus on this early stages of, um, uh, of visual processing. And the big challenge is, um, given the fact that we don't know exactly what uh, goes here, and we're you know, working on it, and it's working. It's we have better ideas than we had 20 years ago, but it's very difficult to propagate back constraints and requirements so that we get a theorem that tells us what the front end should be. And so we proceed by trial and error, in part, and by uh, educated guessing, mathematics, whatever works uh, to try to get a uh, handle on it. Just to give an example, something that people have noticed early on, David Marr, etc., is that. One aspect of images that certainly has to be accounted for and used for representation is, um, is edges. And uh, <coughs> those are places that are very important because surfaces change there, and so the edges are informative for recognition, informative for shape, and so certainly we want to have them. So once you've made this step, you realize that across edges there are changes in brightness, and so you can start reasoning mathematically. And so you can say, well, across an edge, in the first order of approximation, I have a step. That's not entirely true, but let's go with it for a moment. And then maybe I can have a quasi-linear theory in which I, I multiply my signal by a certain kernel k, which had better be a, a matched filter. That's what works best. And um, I will compare this uh, operation with, um, at, with the outcome, with the threshold, and decide if there is a, a, an edge or not. And then. <coughs> If I want to be invariant with respect to translation, I will repeat my operation and I will multiply the edge across, and this is a one-dimensional edge, of course, um, at lots of locations. And maybe I will figure out what's the location of the edge by, uh, by taking a maximum uh, along, along the dimension x and finding out where uh, the edge might be. If you want to uh, find boundaries in two dimensions, this is a curved edge. If you knew what is the orientation of the edge, then you could search for the edge across it by repeating the process I talked about before. But if you don't know a priori what is the orientation, not only you have to take a maximum along uh, the direction z, but you also have to take a maximum across all possible orientations. And so here comes j, which would be the processed image, has to be the maximum on at, uh, along x, y, and theta of this operation. And so there are some subtleties that I'm skipping, skipping but 
if you <coughs> work out your mesh filters and you optimize them for noise rejection, you get operators of this sort. But you would use short ones like this one for um, detecting edges that are very curved and long ones to reject more noise in the presence of edges that are uh, a bit uh, straighter. And so, uh, so sorry, this is, an, of course, an even symmetric operator that is more for lines, and this would be an odd symmetric operator better for, for step edges, but that's the idea. So this is the, the reasoning of engineers, and this has brought engineers to think about, um, think about Gabor functions, Gaussian derivatives, wavelengths, et cetera, as a good front end to, for, for vision. And after the initial um, foray into the space uh, motivated by edges, uh, people started thinking that maybe they could do more. And there are papers from the late 80s, early 90s that show that you can do um, uh, texture analysis, texture classification, texture boundaries, stereoscopic vision, uh, motion analysis, et cetera, with operators of this sort. And so from an initial intuition uh, and thinking about much filtering, one gets into this idea of uh, filters that are tuned for specific features. And then uh, since you want to be invariant with respect to translation, scale, and rotation, you have to have these filters at all possible scales, rotation, translations, maybe even elongations, et cetera. So you have lots of filters deformed in different ways. And so I'll come back to this later. Another train of thinking, which is even longer somehow than the one I just mentioned, is the one of, of deep networks. So that's um, from uh, so Fukushima in the 70s. This is a paper I, I, I ransacked it from the 80s. And um, here the idea is inspired more by biology, in which you would have <coughs> operators that are, that are um, uh, uh, made of units, and you have somehow sum min and maximum operations. And you have various layers of units that map one onto the other. And so you still have the notion of a pipeline of processing. In this case, though, the pipeline of processing is uh, composed of rep repetition of the same step. Now, the scope of this type of work is more limited than the one I was talking about before, because while earlier some of the engineers think about the complete problem of vision, and so you want to do uh, analysis of shapes, you want to do grouping, you want to do visual recognition here, it's mostly about the classification of patterns. And so, uh, so Fukushima using, was using letters to guide his thinking. And the idea is that as you proceed along this cascade, uh, you, you first analyze local patterns like uh, edges and then uh, junctions, and then you put them together into the final concept of a letter. And there are lots of interesting things that came out of this line of thinking, again, motivated by biology, but somewhat taking off then and becoming a bit more of a, an in principle axiomatic point of view of how you would do it. And of course, biology keeps motivating um, uh, engineers uh, in, in also in the details. And so <coughs> we see these hierarchies of processing areas also in biology. And uh, I don't need to go through the details of this. It's just meant to remind ourselves. Um, and if you look at uh, V1, V2 from uh, the 70s, or even the 60s, Hubel and Wiesel, but later on, more and more careful measurements, uh, people saw that amongst the first layers of, um, of processing uh, are simple cells in striate cortex where we have high selectivity for uh, spatial frequency and for orientation. And so this is a plot where each one of these patches is the tuning of a specific cell in area V1. And so there is the notion of of columns, so at each location of a visual uh, space, of a visual field, <coughs> you have multiple mechanisms with all sorts of, uh, of tuning um, or receptive fields. And uh, you have hyper columns, which, uh, uh, where you also have uh, all possible orientations uh, represented in the same spot. So at the convergence of um, the, the Fukushima uh, deep uh, network idea and um, and looking at biology, uh, you find papers like the one of Tommy and Max Rizenuber where there is an attempt at accounting in detail for, for what the brain is doing with one of these uh, perceptron type uh, architectures. And so here you see both motivations at work. And so, um, <clears throat> so clearly one 
one aspect that comes along across from all of these studies and, uh, is that <coughs> you need, if you want to, the system to perform well, you've got to sample very densely the space of orientation scales and uh, elongations, etc. And so you see um, through the years a progression in that sense. And so this is the early work by Jan, very influential, where um, the early stages of processing uh, deal with orientation. And uh, what you see is that, uh, uh, if you read the paper, uh, is that they initialize the system with, um, with simple cell type receptive fields. They are five by five pixel receptive fields, so fairly small, and they cover all possible orientations. And then they optimize them using back propagation, but that's more or less the idea. So here uh, they, they knew that uh, they had to cover um, all spatial positions with these convolutional uh, filters, and so translation invariance is achieved by repeating the same computation across the visual field and orientation by sampling, not densely, but almost densely, the, the space of orientations. Uh, this is from David Lowe, who shows the same idea, and here you see that he injects also scale in his uh, feature finder, and so here he has a Laplacian pyramid where uh, each uh, octave in scale is covered by, f by four samples, but he tried also eight and 16, and he settled for four as being the right number. And so you cannot quite subsample by factors of twitch time. You have to go finer if you want to recover uh, your signal well. And this is sort of the latest uh, in this line of work from uh, Jeff Hinton, Hinton's group. Well, you see again that, uh, so here the network is right from left to right, like the one before by, by Jan. Um, and so here you see that um, the early stages uh, have, um, if I remember well, 48, okay, 48 types of filters. And so it's more than the six types that uh, Jan had in his network. And so here, um, what you see is that uh, as you train the system, uh, you develop not only multiple orientations, but multiple receptive field shapes and also multiple scales. And look at this one is very coarse and low frequency. And then you have some like this one, which are much higher frequency and, and finer scaled. And so here you have orientation, uh, scale, uh, phase, if you wish, and elongation. You have all of these. And um, rather than um, analyzing it like an engineer, uh, uh, Jeff and this whole tradition is the idea is that you propagate errors back and try to learn what are the best filters you could have. And so while the architecture is um, frozen, you cannot uh, learn the, the topology of the architecture, but uh, the parameters that code for the filters are, are learned. So, <clears throat> so in time, what we see is that to obtain better performance, uh, there are lots of things that change, but mostly what changes uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the designers have decided that the front end of the visual system has to have a very fine-grained sampling of orientation, uh, frequency, et cetera. And so initially, we had underestimated the fineness of the sampling, or initially many people had. Now, it was fun to go back to, so this was during my thesis. This is a paper on texture segmentation. And uh, so Jitendra Malik and I were uh, looking at how you could segment textures using, um, using oriented filters and center surround filters and so on. And it's interesting to see how this architecture is, is then um, uh, brought back to life by, by Jeff. Um, so you have, um, here we had 96 filters with all scales. So six orientations and 14 scale samples over two octaves, so very finely sampled scales, halfway rectification, lateral inhibition. Uh, and then some max pooling type uh, stage. <clears throat> so what is, so is, is this all uh, useful and how do we know that it's useful? And um, there are a, a few benchmark data sets that people use to see whether the end-to-end -end system works well. And I focus mostly on visual recognition. This is the one that we use most commonly. It's a pedestrian data set that we collected. It has a million frames and 250,000 frames are hand annotated for pedestrian presence, so there is a very good, um, very good ground truth, and we can compute um, the performance of um, visual detection algorithms with, um, even in the regime in which there are very few false alarms, and that uh, is helpful. 
And so the type of curves we draw look like this. Uh, so this is the INRIA data set on the right and the Caltech um, data set on the left. And um, at, on the x-axis, you see the false positive rate in log scale. And on the y-axis, you see the miss rate. And what you see here is that around 10 to the minus 1 false positives per image, so one false alarm every 10 images, um, you have around 50% miss rate nowadays. But uh, if, you, if you were able to parse these little labels and have a better chart soon, you will see that in time, there is a, a, uh, in the last 10 years, there has been a quite a considerable progress in performance. So from almost not being able to find any pedestrian in the original Viola and Jones uh, work to nowadays where we get maybe 50% of the pedestrians. And the INRIA data set is easier, but they, somehow the order of the, <coughs> of the points is the same. So I'm talking about performance just because I want to uh, make a point that um, if you look through time, and so this is the original Viola and Jones, and then Dalal and Triggs is um, uh, when people realize that a good way of coding for uh, visual appearance was to look at histograms of orientations. And this is Piotr Dollar's work um, where he introduced more channels, not just orientations, but also the hyper columns we saw before. Uh, and what we see is that performance, uh, detection performance improves through time. And so this is 10 years ago, or say 12, 7, 2. Uh, but also, uh, surprisingly, uh, there is a considerable speed up. And so how does it work? And so this is more or less the, the main message I want to give today, that there, are, there is um, engineering behind how to make these systems practical, and you can make them work well. OK. So, so what are the technologies? So as I said before, um, it's a good idea to have a front end composed of, of oriented, um, scaled, et cetera, filters. But the problem is that um, if you want to do it, and the reason why people wouldn't do it until now is it costs you a lot. And so if you want to run an experiment, it may take uh, many weeks to run an experiment, uh, and, uh, and that's too much. And so people move along and then skip it. Um, uh, so how do you uh, deal with hundreds of different front-end filters, some of which may have a footprint of you know, 15 pixels by 15, and so they're very expensive to, to compute? So the, the intuition, um, the earliest they found is from, so yes. Uh, oh, so like okay. Absolutely. Okay, so, uh, yes, so in the, um, in the texture work I, I showed, um, we had 96 <laughs> filters, and we were spanning 2.2 uh, 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 log uh, scale, so the, uh, scale, uh, octaves in scale. Uh, now we have images that have, say, 10 million pixels, and so we would like to cover maybe five octaves in scale. And, uh, and these templates might be quite, um, quite large, right? So if you have... Um, um, if you want to have a big template that covers um, maybe a tenth of the image, you might find yourself that you're convolving with a mask that is 256 by 256. It's totally unfeasible. And you want to cover all possible orientations. If you have filters as long as these, you may want to sample orientations every 30 seconds, or like every 10 degrees or 12 degrees, etc. So it becomes, if you really want to have a rich front end, it becomes uh, computationally a challenge, and so people try to <coughs> avoid it. But in fact, what, so the message today is that there are ways to go about it, and these are, are not so difficult once you think about it. And so this picture comes from uh, an early paper by, by Ted Edelson and, and Jim Bergen, and they were looking, about, uh, they're looking at uh, spatial-temporal filtering. And so here you have space, and here you have time, and an object that moves will generate a tilted stripe on your on your retina in space-time. And they were wondering, how do you produce um, oriented filters in space-time that could detect this phenomenon of something moving? And so these are space-time, spatial-temporal filters. And something they looked at, they realized that uh, separability is a very useful property <coughs> because your computations, if your filter has m rows and n columns, 
the cost of convolving the image in space-time or in space by this filter is, is proportional to m by n. But if the filter is separable, I mean, you can write it as a function of space times a function of time, or maybe two functions of space if you're in space, then your cost is um, uh, much less. It's linear in m and n, and it's not quadratic cost. And so, so you save in the implementation, at least in a digital implementation, you save quite a bit of hardware or, or CPU time. And so the question is, can you generalize this type of thinking? In the same paper, you see that um, <coughs> they realize that uh, uh, a filter built this way will never be uh, selective for one direction of motion and not the other. But if you stagger a number of them in space-time and you compute their sum, then you can obtain uh, an oriented filter. And so here comes a second principle that speeds up your computations. You have simpler filters that then you combine, and by staggering them in different ways, you can obtain different orientations which correspond to different velocities in, uh, in your visual field. And so this is somehow an interesting uh, thinking. This work continued in, in Bill's, with Freeman's thesis, where he looked at orientation in space, and he found that there is a certain class of useful um, orientation selective uh, filters that can be implemented by finite sums of basis functions combined with sine wave-like or periodic uh, weight functions. So the idea is that instead of, if you want to sample orientation at every 10 degrees or 5 degrees or whatever, instead of recomputing your convolution every 5 degrees, you only compute a minimum number of convolutions, just enough, some basis set, and then you take linear combinations of them, which is much cheaper than recomputing every time your convolutions. Okay, so this is called steerability. But very few functions have this property. And so this was a little bit of a, um, a question that was left open. How, how would you do it? And in general, what you would like to do is you have um, <coughs> your kernels are a function of x and orientation, or x and y, or x and y and orientation. And so the idea would be, Let's find ways of decomposing your kernels into separable forms. And they could be separable in space, or it could be separable in space and orientation, or they could be separable in space, orientation, and space again. Uh, and then you could have scale, etc. And so the question is whether you can take these kernels that are a function of lots of different parameters and write them out as sums of separable things that are very inexpensive to compute. And, and so the question is, if you have your favorite filters, and it's unclear how you would derive them, but suppose that you went into edge detection, then you would have an engineering way to think about what are the filters with best properties, whether shorter or longer. But once you're given a set of filters, how would you decompose them in the right way? And this was something I, I was doing here at MIT as a postdoc, well, first in the last year of my PhD at Berkeley and then here. Um, the idea is uh, simple, so here is a simple-minded statement. You can think of a function of two variables as a matrix where one variable is a column variable and the other one was as a row variable. And so the sums I was talking about before uh, can be thought of decomposing your matrix as a set of columns, a set of rows, and then a set of, of weights, parameters. So this matrix here is, uh, is diagonal. And it turns out that the best way to do it is through a singular value decomposition which all of you, I'm assuming, um, know about. And so <clears throat> the idea is that now the columns of U are functions of X, and the, column, the, the columns of V or rows of V transpose are functions of theta, and these are just uh, weight coefficients. And so that's a way to decompose this um, matrix or this kernel into a sum of separable kernels. But the key question is how do you make it efficient? So you want to decompose it into a so this would be the exact decomposition. We would like to decompose it into a small number of these functions, not to have to pay too much in computations. And so <clears throat> it turns out that if this is the singular value decomposition of the kernel, then um, there is a theorem that tells you that the ideal decomposition is one where you stop at some rank r, uh, the sum, and that will give you the best approximation if your budget is limited and you're only able to compute r of these functions. And uh, more in general, um, so I mean, there is a whole functional analysis going behind it. And so there is a, a classic approximation theorem, theorem. So if you have an operator between A and B, and it's a linear operator, and it's compact, then 
it has a discrete spectrum, and what I just said holds. And so the uh, eigenfunctions of L and transpose are these, um, <coughs> are these uh, decomposition uh, functions. Uh, but truly, if we work with uh, computers, we only care about uh, discretized representations, and so just the, the SVD point of view is, uh, is the right one. So, <coughs> so once you have your uh, candidate um, filters, and here it's a decomposition and orientation, you get um, a decreasing error in, and so this is a log scale, decreasing error in approximating them using functions that may look like these. And so here there is a whole set of questions of how, what, it, what are the best versions of these best functions, but I will not get into it. But the point is, uh, it, often you see a very quick decrease, and so here you get 10% error with maybe 10 or 12 of these functions, and you know you can sleep easy because you know that you've done the best you could possibly do. You couldn't possibly do better. And an interesting fact is that as you, as you improve your approximation by adding more and more components, uh, you, get to, you go towards your desired filter, but you pass through filters that are useful themselves. And so if you're looking for, for lines in the image <coughs> and you want to have an elongated filter to reject lots of noise, well, the early approximations are much shorter versions of the same, and so they reject noise a little bit less, but they can deal with lines that have higher curvature. And so this, um, this uh, decomposition automatically gives you a handle also on the <coughs> elongation of these, uh, of these filters. <coughs> And of course, these are desired uh, filters, and depending on, on which one you want to represent, you may have to add more components or fewer components. But it's best if these filters are related in the way that I showed before. Um, <coughs> now, if you want to generalize to, to tensor factorization, I mean, not only you have separable in two, two variables, but you have separable in three variables or more. Then, um, then the theorems are uh, less powerful. And basically, it's not a convex problem. You've got to uh, gradient descent your way towards the best approximation, but uh, this is perfectly doable numerically, and it's not, not a big deal. Um, <coughs> now, if you have scale, scale, the engineering of scale also is important, and um, uh, so a big, um, a big wavelet like this one versus a small one well, the small one may have one, two, three, four, five samples. It's cheap to compute, but here you may have 20, 30 samples. And it's a bit of a waste of computation because the wavelet is not changing much. And so the best way to implement it is first to subsample your image, then to apply the highest possible, the, the highest possible frequency wavelet you can represent, and then to upsample again. Now, <coughs> Roberto Manduki looked at this and <coughs> went to the, to the bitter end of this line of reasoning. And so this... Uh, seemingly complicated lattice of computations does the magic of doing the least amount of work for computing one of these um, multi-resolution, multi-orientation pyramids. And so the image comes in here, and the output is out here. And what happens to the image is that it gets uh, resampled by two each time. And each time you resample it, um, you have filters that allow you to resample, to subsample it. And you have filters you apply in X and Y after subsampling it, and then you re-upsample it again, filter it again, and put it out. And each one of these filters, and here I color-coded the different types of filters, <coughs> is extremely economical and parsimonious. And with this type of architecture, you can deal with orientation, scale, elongation, and all of that, whatever you, you want. And Eero Simoncelli worked along the same lines. I don't have slides from his, uh, from his work. But this would be the case in which you have multi-scale, multi-orientation filters like this one. Uh, and in the lattice you saw before, uh, these are the filters you, sh you would use somehow. And so you have lots of one-dimensional filters that go into X and Y and scale and this and that. And once you recompose it all by just taking linear combinations, you can obtain your pyramid at all possible orientations and scales, et cetera. And it's the most, most efficient you could possibly have. Now, the last thing I would like to talk about is um, some recent work by Piotr Dollar, who um, uh, uh, is, is looking at, um, at detection. And he realized that there is yet another uh, principle you may use to speed up your computations. And this has to do with the fact that you can predict the output of linear operators, but also nonlinear ones, through scale by taking very few samples and then extrapolating. So here is the idea. Uh, the initial idea is you have uh, a signal, it's this gray line here, an image, 
and you have two samples, so these are, say, two photoreceptors, and you compute a gradient because you want to compute a gradient. It's useful for some computation. Now, suppose that you upsampled this, um, this signal, and so you add a fake or a synthetic uh, sample here, and you take the gradient again, well, you, take, uh, you will take half of the, of the difference in height, uh, and suppose that you, you focus not on the grade, so that suppose that now this becomes your new unit of measurement uh, as opposed to this one, then the gradient you measure in the image by taking first uh, neighbor finite differences is half as much. So the ratio between the upsampled gradient and the original gradient is uh, one half, or between the original and the sample is two. Okay, so this is true, and if you do it in 2D, it's not exactly two because you have cross terms and so on, but you get um, the idea. Uh, you get it. So if you measure the um, real image versus the upsampled image, you get this ratio. Now, this happens also the other way around. So if you downsample the image, there is a fixed ratio, which turns out to be around 0 0.25, 27, 26. Um, and, uh, and it's because you lose the resolution in this case if you downsample the image. So, <coughs> so this is uh, what happens. But uh, so the, uh, also other operators behave in the same way. So you can predict the ratio between the original and the upsample or downsampled image quite, um, quite well in normal everyday images. And so this would be predicting uh, a, a, um, a gradient <coughs> histogram from an upsample down to a downsampled version of the image. And so you have um, the original data is uh, the green lines and blue and yellow are the uh, downsampled and unsampled predictions, okay? Now, that's not true for all images. If you have textures, then the predictions are horrible. So if the image is scale invariant, if you wish, then things work well, but if the image has a preferred orientation and scale, then things are not so, not so good. But for regular images that we're interested in, things go this way. Now, this generalizes, it turns out, to all possible it, it, uh, local operators of interest to vision people. So you have histograms of gradients, histograms of normalized gradients, uh, grayscale image, the original, uh, the local standard deviation of the image, difference of Gaussian operators, hog operators, etc. And so what happens here, you are trying to predict what, <coughs> what will this operator look at different scales just by upscaling, uh, by multiplying what you computed at a given scale by a constant. And the more you try to extrapolate, as you know, uh, the, the more error there will be. So <clears throat> this is an estimate of error on individual images. And basically what you find is that if you stay within one log scale, uh, you can predict, so these are the sigmas of, uh, of the prediction error, uh, you can stay within a reasonable amount of error. So, so this suggests <coughs> uh, a new way of, of computing these front ends. Uh, instead of taking the original image and, and subsampling it at uh, regular intervals, very small ones in which you maybe fraction each uh, octave into 10 samples or eight samples, and then computing from each one of these your, um, your derived operator, be it hog or whatever gradient or uh, second derivative uh, you wish to compute. <coughs> The best thing is to take very coarse samples in scale, compute the operator once, and then extrapolate in order to compute the other ones with a small amount of error, okay? And so, so this is a different point of view in, the, in how you should do things. So there was one, I think, came out, it's called the uh, fastest pedestrian detector in the West. It came out in the MVC, and that's where we saw that we could speed up computations by a factor of 20 or, or so. And, uh, and you will find a paper by a Swiss group at ETH um, who re-implemented it on uh, GPUs. And so now pedestrian detection on big images runs at 100 frames a second or some, some very nice uh, number. So, um, okay, let me skip. I think that this is pretty clear. So this is probably, the, yeah, this is my last slide. And so what we see now is that um, the uh, pedestrian detectors, um, and so this is again, the gray ones are from the literature. And so again, you have <coughs> miss rate, and so going down is good. 
and going to the right is good, which is frames per second. And so these are numbers on images that are, I think that they are 640 by 480, but I'm not sure, on a regular CPU in MATLAB. And you see that um, using the technique I just told you about uh, will speed things up considerably. So this is 64 uh, frames per second. And, and there is a paper that is going to come out soon by Piotr Dollar on this, where it, there are, as you might imagine, lots of different architectural decisions and combinations you can do. And, um, and this is completely empirical, and it's, uh, you know, which combination works best depends on the statistics of your images. And so we know what happens with pedestrians, but we don't know what happens with uh, other type of data sets. Okay, so I'll conclude. So I've told you about uh, the filtering front end and how useful it is. The fact that it's not motivated yet by, um, by theorems, if you consider the end-to-end -end, uh, end -end performance of a vision system. But it appears to be a very good thing to do. And we've come at it from lots of different angles, from the wavelet uh, point of view, from multi-rate filtering, from looking at specific tasks like edge detection, from uh, deep networks that get optimized to, to do recognition, et cetera. Uh, the, the trend seems to be the one of having more and more uh, samples in scale orientation and rotation, et cetera, and we see that performance of recognition systems improve as we increase the number of samples we take, and so the front end, even is, uh, from neural networks to uh, perceptrons and so on, to other type of more engineering-like systems, uh, improves with uh, this front end being richer and richer. Uh, and I've told you about two lines of thinking. One is how to uh, compute uh, these um, multi-scale motor orientation filters at all possible scales and rotations by taking linear combinations. And then I told you about um, the fact that by exploiting the statistics of natural images, not all images, uh, it's possible to cut further into the computational costs by only computing these operators at wide, widely spaced scale intervals and then extrapolating back to compute everything else. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's a very good question. And so it turns out that you, <coughs> so with, okay, so the answer is I don't know, frankly. I, so it's, um, uh, we, what we see, and I, I didn't do a good job at showing you the architecture of the recognition system, is we use an enormous number of different channels, so in orientation and also combinations of um, histograms, uh, we, can, we can switch this off, histograms of uh, orient hogs and so on. So there are lots of nonlinearities going. And then uh, using boosting, you select um, different uh, channels uh, in, and you average them out in different patches in an image that may contain or not a pedestrian. And so there are enough nonlinearities later that it's difficult to predict the final output. But, so you need to compute those channels, but you don't need to recompute them at every scale. Okay. That's, that's very okay. Okay. Yes. So the vision system, it doesn't seem that it uses that many Uh, yes. Right. So, <coughs> okay. So, the, uh, it's uh, so there are two two answers. So one is, you know, what is the selectivity in location and orientation of single mechanisms, and then how do different mechanisms, how do these mechanisms get combined to calculate the final representations? And so early on, if you looked at the early literature on wavelets, people thought about orthogonal representations, and uh, and definitely the samples that came out, although they were sufficient to reconstruct the image, if it, they, they were not informative enough to be used in subsequent stages of computation. And then uh, they realized that there should be over-representation, and that gives you a uh, substrate for computing, say, recognition operators that is more invariant uh, to all of these uh, operations. And so you might have 
individual mechanisms having fairly broad tuning, but you may need lots of them. You may need redundancy, which may be obtained in different ways. Tommy. Um, so let me try to play the role of being provocative. And at the same time, of replacing Amnon cannot come at a motorcycle accident in Namibia. Uh, wrong place, yeah. Right. So the question is. Uh, um, it's okay, by the way. But um, do we have com there are commercial pedestrian detection? Mm -hmm. You know, in cars you can buy. How how do you compare? You know, for okay, that's a. I, I wish that Amnon was okay. here, and I, I I bet you he would not ask that question, because we budgeted him for six months to compare alongside our to benchmark alongside yeah. us. Um, so my impression is. That, uh, so there is a big difference in the claim performance of the system uh, and the performance we measure on individual frames. And there are two main reasons for that. One is here we have performance on individual frames. They use all sorts of system level aspects, namely combining frames that happen in sequence in time to clean up the signal and uh, the position of pedestrians within the visual field to decide scale. So lots of system like things. Um, my guess is that uh, the performance you saw here is comparable to that of their system, or maybe it might even be better. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. Uh, and so their numbers come out of wrapping the fundamental per frame performance into system level issues. Um, so he told us that they weren't willing to compare it because it would be too much work for them. This is what I heard. But still, uh, if I could beam to him a little uh, uh, prod, <laughs> I would love to see an official comparison of the per frame I mean, performance. Another, another issue that I know from him is that he does not think um, there are big enough databases among in the, the open in the, in the academic world to make really a comparison. I guess that's my guess. You know, their their tests. Yeah, he gave me an, an you know enormous number. Yeah. Um, I yes, I think for academic purposes, the, the Caltech pedestrian detector data set with a million frames and 250,000 of which are annotated is pretty good. You can go down to 10 to the minus four full salam rate and see what the performance yeah, well, is. There is a problem with that, right? With that data set. I'm mentioning this because it's not could be a general problem. Is that although there are several hours of driving, they are in a limited environment. You know, yes. You're not driving, you're probably driving in Pasadena. And so uh, we drove in Pasadena, Los Angeles. We have two copies. Yeah. One is in uh, Pasadena, Los Angeles, and, and one is in know, Japan. Rain, rain and snow. And yes, ice. we don't have rain and snow, and we don't have night. So it's, yeah, it's a sub subsection of, of the total problem. There is no question. I think it's good for academic research. If I wouldn't base a startup company on this data set, we, we wouldn't know what happens at night or, or, or in, in the rain. In Namibia, maybe. Right, in Namibia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay.